actually letting go was the first track that me and dennis uh co-wrote for this record going into this album and that really set the pace of how that record was going to develop it's a really heavy song but at the same time has this uh, modern touch modern vibe and it's uh it's a, a low tuned track uh, so it has that really heavy sludgy kind of vibe so there's speed but at the same time there's a lot of groove in it so I think it's one of the fastest and one of the strongest tracks on the record. I think it's a really good choice for an opener on the record. That riff is obviously very uh, inspired by Black Sabbath. I sent it to Dennis and I think that probably triggered something in him and he sent it back to me, uh, the demo with that chorus, Mr. Manson. Obviously he must have been uh, influenced by, I don't know, Mr. Crowley or Perry Mason or something. He's like, well, those were taken already, so we went for Mr. Manson. I mean, it's always an interesting topic. Uh, Charles Manson and the murders. Uh, I mean, so many years later, people still talk about it. It's kind of a crazy coincidence as well that we wrote that song and after we finished it, Charles Manson passed away. I wrote that riff back in 2010, I believe. Uh, actually, it's a track that I, uh, I wrote for Ozzy and it's one of the tracks we wrote together on the road, but obviously nothing ever happened out of that. Um, but I had the music and I wanted to finish it up because it's, um, I thought it was a really good riff. And I even used to play the main riff as a part of my guitar solo during the shows with Oz back then. Yeah, I like the lyrical meaning as well. It can be, uh, you can say it's kind of autobiographical, but at the same time, I think it applies to uh, any person who's willing to take chances to stand on his own and just not being afraid and be fearless. Fearless is actually um, an instrumental track on the record. I originally named it Fearless because it's just like a very technical track and it's sometimes it's pretty scary to go into those territories and play all these, uh, record all these very technically demanding tracks and then going and taking them on stage and executing them. Um, but that's what fear is all about. Not giving a shit and then just going for it. Nothing to Say is the ballad of the album. It's more of a power ballad. Um, it's, I think it's the second track that me and Dennis co-wrote for this record. Such a great chorus, it's one of my favorites. Um, it has that vibe. Money For Nothing is one of my all-time favorite songs when I was growing up. I love Dire Straits, I love Mark Knopfler as a guitarist. I just had this uh, idea that I would have liked to do a cover of that song someday, but not just do the same exact version, do like a heavier version of it. Basically, we are doing the song in, uh, in a lower tuning, and it's half tempo uh, from what the original track is. Uh, so it's really slow and groovy and sludgy kind of riff now. <laughs> I think I wrote that riff a while ago and I recorded it quickly on my phone. So I had, I had that riff, uh, I was carrying that on my phone for months and months and I was looking for new ideas to work on and then I listened to that and I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. It's got this kind of 90s new metal vibe, if you like, and then all of a sudden it breaks into this twin part harmony, like very Thin Lizzy, Iron Maiden kind of style. So it's a weird mixture, but somehow it works. And again, I really love the chorus. It's really catchy, it's really anthemic, and to the point.
Thrill of the Chase uh, is the second instrumental in this record. I mean, this is a song that showcases obviously a lot of my guitar playing and it's also a, a tribute to uh, a lot of my uh, guitar heroes from the 80s and 70s. Uh, it's got a heavy, I would say, uh, Michael Schenker and Scorpions influence and obviously a lot of the uh, 80s shredders that I grew up listening to uh, the Mike Varney guitar scene uh, so this I just wanted to create a track that takes you back to that time there's an interesting story behind this song actually when I started working with Jackson Guitars, um, and I was over at their factory in Corona, California, we popped over to, um, to the next room to see a new uh, uh, Fender guitar, because Jackson is owned by Fender, and uh, they were um, doing a photo shoot that very same day for a, a very special limited edition Stratocaster, which was the Gary Moore Strat, and I immediately fell in love with that guitar. and. Um, I said to the guys right away, I need to have one of those. Mind you, there's only 60 of them made worldwide. The minute that I picked up the guitar when I arrived in my house and I plugged it in, uh, the first thing that came out was the riff to a Big City. I immediately recorded it on my computer. That was a magic moment right there and then. And that's how that song developed. <laughs> It's a low-tuned track on the guitar, very heavy, very groovy, uh, and very atmospheric at the same time. Obviously a lot of uh, Iomi vibes on there, and at the same time it has a little bit of that modern vibe that bands like Alter Bridge have, which I really love as well. Yeah, it was just my attempt just trying to make something really groovy, almost like a classic rock kind of riff with a more modern touch. Probably the most rock and roll type of track on the record. Um, there's a lot of guitar, it's a really cool intro, a bit more technical. It's on the Digipack version of the album, so yeah. The last track on the album is called Aftermath and it's an instrumental. Uh, it's probably one of my heaviest instrumentals that I've written so far. There's a lot of riffs on there. The song is, I mean, those riffs are followed by a really big heroic uh, melody, which is something that I really like to do when I write instrumentals. I really need the melody to be there, not just like all the technical parts. So I, I like to have to combine uh, the riffing and also like have a big, big melody. So hope you enjoy it. Yeah. 